Well, hey there, everybody. Good to see you. I've got a new setup today. And so like I've uh, mentioned in a video that I just finished on Bible basics with some others, I'm taking a little bit of extra time today to make sure that everything is going A-OK. -okay. So, um, I got my Facebook Live and I got my YouTube Live all running through the same webcam now, doing a platform that I have called caster.io and I'm hoping that uh, you're seeing this. Um, here's a couple things that I'd like to just share. Ta-da! This is only up for today, maybe tomorrow, but you'll observe that uh, we're not as close together as we used to be. And um, this is my whiteboard that I have been using and this was a secondary whiteboard up at the church building that I procured. But then uh, I decided that instead of having this with this awkward seam in the middle, I would invest, thankfully, because of a generous benefactor, in um, a 4x8 sheet of whiteboard. So this is currently 3x9. There, tomorrow or the next day, whenever I'm able to finally get to it, I'm going to make it a 4x8 continuous piece of whiteboard, and it's going to just let me go crazy with the whiteboard illustrations. So I'm very thankful for that. Now. Um, a couple things about uh, today's study. I didn't get the chance to work on study questions, so there will be no study questions for today. But I will make a couple of announcements. First, since I don't have my camera or my, my phone up there, um, I definitely can't interact with you. And I've been telling you all along I prefer not to interact with the, the comment section. I'm not going to be responding to them. However, if you have a technical issue, you can now text me or message me on the phone, and I'll make sure it's not on silent. And uh, so hopefully that'll work itself out. And uh, anyway, so you can message me and just let me know if it's not working, and uh, that's how I'm going to interact is through private messages. Uh, let's see. I want you to, if you haven't already, go check out Clint DeFrance's Biblical Studies program of Tulsa on YouTube. It's five words, Biblical Studies Program of Tulsa. And he's doing a live gospel meeting every night at 730. You've missed three of them, but you can still go check those out. And if you want to watch them live, you can go there at 730 Central Standard Time tonight and see him there. Okay, so the cool thing about having my phone back is now I can set a timer. And I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes. Um, I'm known to ramble. And so I'm trying to do my best to avoid rambling. And uh, so I'm going to set it at 32. That way I can ramble for another couple of minutes while people get logged on. And that's set. And that'll just kind of remind me that I need to wrap it up. So anyway, um, so I'm very thankful. I have all this space. I'm able to kind of spread out and, and move around and go back and forth. And so hopefully uh, this will be helpful for us. It'll, it'll allow me to write a little bit bigger. I would prefer uh, if you would send me a message, you know, if, if you're able to read these things. Um, and then finally, this is semi-related, but I was looking at the earlier video, and maybe it's just because of the camera or whatever, but the lines on my shirt were really distracting. They were kind of like a little bit more digital wavy than the rest of me was. And so I kind of need to know if that's going to be how others see it as well, because if that's the case, I need to wear solid shirts and not shirts with lines that make me look like I have digital waves going on. Okay, um, I'll probably forget to say it at the end, so I'll go ahead and say it now. If you haven't already subscribed on YouTube, if you haven't already liked and followed on Facebook, please like the pages. The, the content is good too. If you wanna like the video and share the videos, please do. But I'm specifically talking about the pages. The more people that like them, subscribe to them, then that means when people do a Google search or a search on Facebook or YouTube, then Pure and Simple Bible will come up. So help me spread the word. You ready to begin? Let's get started with Ruth chapter 2. I'm going to go ahead and get my Bible open to Ruth chapter 2 because there is a, a section in there that I want to read to you. And uh, so if you want to have your Bible open and flipped over to Ruth chapter 2, then that'll be a great way to start the study together. It comes right after the book of Judges because the book of Ruth is happening concurrently during the period of the Judges. And so while there's these 
uh, men who are leading Israel and, and Israel and the tribes are, are kind of falling a little bit farther, each judge, it seems, into sin and uh, they're, they're getting, you know, just further into darkness. There's this ray of light and it comes from somebody who's not even an Israelite. She's a Moabitess. And as we learned yesterday, Ruth is the daughter-in-law of a woman named Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. In fact, let's, I know this is uh, in regard to Ruth's solution that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But let's just talk about Naomi. Uh, Naomi, her name means pleasant. You could write that down to go along with our notes from yesterday. She was very pleasant. Um, she had a, a great family. She had a husband. She had two sons. They went to Moab during a time of famine in their land, in the land of uh, Israel, specifically in the tribe of Judah, near the town of Bethlehem. She was an Eph Ephraimite. And anyway, uh, Ephrathite. I know I wasn't getting it right. Ephrathite. Naomi goes in full, but she comes out empty. And at the very end of chapter 1, she says, Call me Mara, because I am bitter. The Lord has dealt bitterly against me. And one of the main lessons that we learned from yesterday was that Naomi, this is how she felt, but it's not who she was. She was not bitter. And in fact, in chapter 2 today, and in chapter 3 and 4, we will find that she is quite the opposite of bitter. She's very pleasant. She's very helpful. And uh, so we're, we're going to look at her and observe her. She's a secondary character, so to speak, um, this, because the book's named Ruth, and it's primarily about Ruth, and then this person whose name starts with the B that we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, Naomi is very important because her trajectory of going from having everything to losing everything to feeling awful in the moment, and but then to come back and realize that truly she did have uh, uh, a wonderful life, even though she went through great tragedy. Uh, I want us to just remember her. Ruth's name means friendship. And man, what a friend she was to Naomi. She's a daughter-in-law. She's a Moabitess. She's not even a member of the house of Israel. And uh, she, unlike the other daughter-in-law, refuses to leave Naomi. And so one of the things that we learned yesterday was that Ruth uh, has great faith. <clears throat> and she is willing to follow Naomi. She's going to be a foreigner Somebody reached out to me yesterday and asked this question, and honestly, I don't know the answer. And she asked, would she know their language? Would they have had different languages? And, you know, I do see um, it's going to be many years later in, in Nehemiah chapter 13 that there were people who married people from Moab, and they spoke the language of Ashdod and not the Hebrew language. I'm going to go ahead and say, though, that they did speak a common language because obviously she's able to communicate with Naomi, and then later on she'll be able to communicate with others as well. So was she bilingual or was it a common language? I honestly don't know the answer to that question, but I thought it was a really interesting question. But she's going to leave her native culture. She's going to leave everything she's known, and she's going to travel with Naomi back to Bethlehem. Now, let's jump into chapter 2, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, about something. Okay. Uh, Ruth chapter 2, a woman of integrity. We've seen Ruth as a woman of faith, but now let's talk about her integrity. Her work ethic might be another way to describe it if you'd like to. Ruth has a law problem, and that's where I'd like to begin. Ruth uh, is dealing with being without a protector. Um, we have to remember that during this time and in this culture, all wealth and rights were passed down hereditarily. Hereditarily. And what that means is father to son, father to son, father to son. Could it go father to daughter? There are some occasions we do see that in the Bible. Specifically, I think in the book of Joshua, there were some daughters of a man who died, and they go and they're able to get their inheritance. But by and large, it passes father to son. Now, I don't want you to look at this with 21st century eyes where you say, oh, it's the patriarchy. What I want you to look at it is with the eyes of people living in this time. I think we do a disservice whenever we consider the Bible only through a 21st century lens. And if people in those times didn't live up to our standards of what we think is right, then it's not worthy of our consideration. And 
I think quite the opposite is true. I guess the reason that I'm sharing that with you is I remember reading an article, it's been a few years ago, about an actress who used to have faith in God, but she gave it up. And one of the reasons that she gave it up was because she felt like the Bible was so biased against women and that there was no examples of good hero or heroines for her to look at that she just uh, decided that she didn't want to believe anymore. And so here's my encouragement to her and you if maybe you feel similar. First, we have to accept that cultures around the world work differently than the way that we may have been raised. That's true even today. If you have not traveled abroad or have not lived in another culture, then you may not appreciate that as much as somebody who has. For those of us who have lived in other countries, we go places where things look wrong or strange, different, backwards, uh, not normal, and that's okay because that's their culture. So think about how this is a culture that's not just on another side of the world, but it's also in another time. So we're going to take things that maybe we don't appreciate and we don't think they're normal or right or good, but we can say, you know what, that's the way it was because that's the way it was. Now, uh, all wealth and rights were passed down hereditarily, and so if, if a family leader has no heir, then the land and the widow are unprotected. So write that down. The land and the widow are unprotected. Now, what exactly does that mean? It means that there's no one to take care of them. Uh, there's no one to provide for them. Um, unless they're able to work for themselves, then they're going to be destitute. Now, thankfully, Ruth is going to be able to work, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But here's the law problem that Ruth had. First, Elimelech, who is the family leader, died in chapter 1, right at the very beginning. And then her husband, uh, Malon, and his brother, Kilion, also died. And uh, so this family group, their tribal leader died, or the leader of their home died, the heir also died, and so the widow, that is Naomi, also Ruth, and I mean, she's a foreigner as well, and, and she's looked down upon just based on what we see in some other scriptures about the way Moabites were treated. I think it's fair to assume that people are going to look at her with a little bit of a, at least those who didn't know her are going to look at her with a, maybe an eye that's just a little bit inquisitive about what's this foreigner doing among us. Now, here is Ruth's solution to the problem. R the problem is that uh, they have nothing. They have this plot of land, and they're you know, not able to, I guess, fully access it or use it. They're not able to uh, access some of the protection that's available to them. And you know what Ruth's so uh, solution is? She says to Naomi, I'm going to work. And so Ruth goes to work. What kind of work can a foreigner do? What kind of work can somebody who's not skilled in, in a labor or in a trade do during this time period? They can farm. And not farm their own land, but rather they go and they glean after other farmers. You see, uh, we're going to talk about this very strange coincidence, both in chapter 2 and 3 and 4. In fact, we could even say about the whole book, it just so happens. Now, I'll go ahead and spoil it for you. The, one of the great themes of Ruth is the providence of God, and that God can work behind the scenes, and uh, even when characters in the Bible don't mention his work specifically, we see his hand providentially working through them. And so here's what I'd like to say. It just so happens, Ruth chapter 2 begins, or rather I think it's chapter 1 the way that it ends, but in chapter 2, it just so happens that it's the barley harvest. They just so happen to came back just in a time when there's going to be food that they can go to some other people's fields and they can glean that food. Now, what does that mean whenever we're talking about how she's going to go and glean after others? Well, uh, let's consider that a plot of land is a big square, right? And so the, the farmer, he's going to sow his uh, barley and his wheat and everything else on this plot of land, and he's going to get to fill it out completely. Well, there are some laws that uh, we can consider, and you could write down the book of Leviticus, 
And it's Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9. Oh, my. My handwriting. This, I have too much whiteboard space for my handwriting to be that bad. I apologize. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. Deuteronomy. I have a reason for writing these down, so just stay with me and write them down too if you're taking notes, and I hope you are. I appreciate note takers. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19 through 22. These are all, what will we call them? God's social security. <laughs> God's social security. Now, some of you around the world may not appreciate that phrase if your country does not have Social Security. Other countries, uh, you may appreciate that. Where I live in America, we have something called Social Security, and that is that our government, in theory, and let's not get into specifics here, but in theory, our government will provide uh, for those who cannot provide for themselves. Social Security. Well, God also had laws for those who uh, were foreign coming into the land, for those who are widows, unable to care for themselves uh, and, and unable to protect themselves. And that was that one of the specific laws was that we have this field and the one who owns it is only supposed to reap kind of in a circle, thus leaving the uh, outside. I'm going to use the color green. The corners of it are meant for those who couldn't provide for themselves. And so the poor of the land who didn't have land and uh, didn't have the ability to care for themselves, if they're willing to work and they're capable of getting out there, then they're going to get out and they're going to uh, get to share in those. Also, as the workers are harvesting in this middle section, right, so they're going to get all of this barley at this time, but every now and then they're going to drop one. And so the poor are also able to follow along. And as they drop one, they pick it up. Drop one, pick it up. And what they're getting is their daily bread. Have you heard that phrase before? Have you heard it recently in my uh, Bible studies? I know you remember every study that I've done, right? Well, in Matthew chapter 6, when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus prays, and he gives this example prayer, one of the things he prays about is, uh, give us this day our daily bread. And then a little bit later in the chapter, when he talks about worry and anxiety, he says that uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. And so there's this idea here of daily bread. Back in the Old Testament, and then Jesus brings it up in the New Testament and the idea is, do what you can for today. Now, this may be a, a tangent, and uh, my timer may go off because of my tangents. But I tend to worry, and I tend to worry about things I can't control. And I tend to worry about things that I can't control in the future. I'm doing exactly the opposite of what Jesus told me to do, and that was... Be concerned of the present, be thankful for what you have in the present, and use what you have in the present to move on and to motivate yourself into the future. So here's maybe a word of encouragement to those out there. I, there's been so many people offering encouragement. I'm so thankful for our brotherhood who is doing such things, such mighty works. But just think about this. Sometimes you have to take it a day at a time. And sometimes you have to take it an hour at a time or a minute at a time. Sometimes your checklist needs to be to get out of bed, to make breakfast, and beyond that, you're not sure what's coming next. Uh, your checklist might be whatever I need to get done today, and you're not, you're not really thinking about tomorrow. There's this concept of work for today's bread. So I want you to take that and I want you to apply it. Matthew chapter 6 is a great scripture for you to meditate on. So write down Matthew chapter 6 about daily bread. And we'll see that Ruth was going out to glean in the fields for daily bread. She didn't have a plan to get rich. She didn't have a plan to get married. She didn't have a plan for anything other than daily bread. Now, that's important because she's a woman of integrity. She's willing to help this widowed mother-in-law get daily bread. As a foreigner, she's going to go out into somebody's field, and she's going to try to help Naomi get daily bread. She has no idea where she's going, but it just so happens 
It just so happens that she goes, let's see, I got the color black up there. She goes to Boaz's field. So let's talk a little bit about Boaz. This is the third character in, in this four chapter narrative. Uh, he's really in, I think, uh, number two or maybe number three as far as the, the amount of dialogue that he has. Ruth is obviously the main character, but Boaz is uh, necessary to the story because of some very key information. Now, at, right off the bat, we have a few pieces of information about Boaz that are uh, really good to know. First, we know, we learn in chapter two that he's a relative. Aha, that will come back in a moment. But we know that he's related to Naomi. Second, we know that he is very wealthy. Now, you know, sometimes they say you can't write something. You can't write fiction because the truth is so strange. But what I like to think is that a lot of our greatest works of fiction are based off of truth. And I believe this really happened. I believe that the Bible is true and that these uh, narratives that we read in it actually happened. But what I like to think is that some of the greatest romances of all time, and I mentioned one yesterday as one of my favorites, but uh, some of the greatest romance novels of all time, I think, are based off of the story of Ruth and Boaz, specifically Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen. I mean, you've got Mr. Darcy, and maybe some of you are thinking I'm obsessed with that book. I have not read it in probably, uh, I don't know, 12, 15 years. But I do love that book. I think it's just an excellent work of literature. But the concept there is you had somebody who was a very wealthy person that had uh, a, was missing something in his life. And it's filled with the, uh, I guess, the beginning of a relationship with somebody uh, who was his equal in many ways, but and they are also a little bit different in many ways. So Boaz and Ruth kind of follow that same narrative, or we could flip it and say Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet actually follow the same narrative of Ruth and Boaz because he is related, he is wealthy, and he is godly. That one's important too. As Boaz is introduced in chapter 2, he goes up to his workers and he says... May the Lord bless you. Let's see. Oh, I missed it up. May the Lord be with you. I knew that there was something missing there. May the Lord be with you. To which his workers reply... May the Lord bless you. What kind of a relationship does a boss and his employees have where the, blo the boss comes up to the employees and says, God bless you in the morning. And the workers re reply, and the Lord be with you. Wouldn't you like a boss like that? You know, sometimes uh, in the past, whenever I worked uh, jobs, I had bosses that, you know, weren't exactly like Boaz. And so I, did, I didn't get greeted in the morning with, may the Lord be with you, Jonathan. And maybe I didn't respond with, and may the Lord bless you, boss. But think about how this dynamic works, that you had a godly boss, a godly steward, somebody that would come out and would give you your work for the day, but they would always begin it with, and may the Lord be with you. I think that's really cool about Boaz. Well, it just so happens that Ruth goes gleaning in Boaz's field, and it just so happens that Boaz has heard about Ruth. Now, specifically, he talks to some of his workers, and he says, who is that woman over there? Now, you know, we could, I guess, make it more romantic than what the scriptures do. Honestly, we have no, I guess, uh, description of Ruth as a beautiful woman. I tend to think that she's beautiful because Boaz is able to see her and, and, and notices her. But maybe he notices her garb. She's still kind of wearing some funeral clothing. Maybe he notices her because she's a Moabitess and there's just some distinctions between her and the other workers. But I like to think of it as kind of the, the Boaz is scanning his field and Whoa. he happens to see Ruth across the way. And it's one of not necessarily love at first sight, but there's definitely intrigue. At first sight. So Boaz looks across the way and uh, tells his workers, whose woman is that? And they say, that's that daughter-in-law of Naomi. That's that Moabite girl that you've heard about. 
Ah, that's right. He has heard about her. So he tells his workers to make sure that they're, they're throwing out a little bit more grain for her, right? And he, at lunchtime, calls her over and he says, I want you to come eat with us. So whereas typically at lunchtime, those that weren't part of the hired hands would just go eat by themselves and the hired hands would all go eat together with the boss, he invites her to come eat with him. And he tells her, I have heard about you. I, I, I want to read it. I'm, I'm writing up on the board some of the Jonathan Edwards translation, but I want to read uh, what he says. So in verse 10, she falls down on her face to the ground, bows low, and says, Why have I found favor in your eyes? Why should you take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Boaz answered her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your birth, and how you have come to a place, or come to a people who you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wing you have come for refuge. You know what Boaz does there? I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the board. Let's see, I'll use red. Boaz begins their relationship with spiritual intent. You know, he has land, power, privilege, wealth, etc. If he's attracted to her, he could just take her as a wife. He doesn't do that. Rather, Boaz brings her over and he says, I just want you to know I've heard about what you've done and I think it's really great. He gives her some extra food. He tells her, I want you to stay in my field. I don't want you to go anywhere else. We don't know what other people might be like or how they might treat you, so I want you to stay here. My workers are going to make sure you have enough at the end of the day for your daily bread and more. He even offers her food, and I can only imagine, can't you just see it where all the workers are kind of sitting in a circle, and Boaz calls her over, and then he offers her some of the roasted grain, and all of the women are kind of looking at each other like, hey, hey, you see what boss is doing? And some of the guys maybe are off sitting over in the corner chuckling with each other about what Boaz is doing, because Boaz, um, as we might see in chapter 3, it's a little bit of a speculation, but Boaz may be a little bit older than Ruth. And so their relationship is built off of this mutual trust and respect for what they see each other doing. And I love how when he says, I've heard about you, I've heard everything you've done, and may God bless you for it. So there's a great example here of their relationship beginning with spiritual intent. And so the application for you, especially for those of you who aren't married, those of you who are younger, is the relationship you should be looking for in a husband and a wife should be one where your partner is going to bless you spiritually and where you can be a spiritual blessing to them. I want you to think about this, and this is for our married couples as well. We're married in this life. Jesus said in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 22, that the angel, or that we will not be married, but we'll be like the angels, neither married or given in marriage whenever we're in heaven. And so the spiritual relationship I have with Marissa right now, my wife, that's going to be the relationship that, that carries over into heaven. She'll be my sister in Christ. Yes, I think we will have a bond that we helped each other get to heaven, but that physical relationship that we share now in marriage, that, that doesn't carry over. What sort of spiritual relationship do you have with your spouse? What sort of spiritual relationship do you want to have with your spouse someday? Because the spiritual will remain even when the physical does not. In heaven, you will know each other. Are you helping each other get there right now? That's kind of the question that I want to ask. Are you helping your partner get to heaven? Are you helping your, your husband and wife? How will you help if you're not married? Okay. So at the end of the day, Ruth is taking just a bunch of barley back to the house. She has gone out to work. Her solution was to work for daily bread. And yet when she comes back to Naomi, whoop, she's got a lot more than 
she thought she might have. And not only that, but it says that she brings out some of the extra food that she couldn't eat. And so it's almost like, uh, you know, somebody who goes to a big dinner party and they're stuffing the rolls in their purse on the way out. I don't think it was exactly like that. But, now, or, but Ruth had leftover food for when she was eating with the workers and Boaz, and she brings that back to Naomi. So what do they have together? They have enough for the day, but they also have enough for tomorrow. And they also have enough to sell and be able to kind of rebuild their life in the area. But let me move my table over real quick and take a drink. It just so happens that she went to work. It just so happens that she went to work in Boaz's field and that Boaz was one of, or had all these good characteristics. It just so happens that he'd already heard about her some, that he investigated about her, that he sees her as this woman of integrity, that she was loyal to her mother-in-law, that she's willing to come to a new place, a new people, a new faith. He sees all these things about her. It just so happens that when Ruth gets home and explains where she went, that Naomi uses some very special words. She says, oh, my daughter, did you know that... He is a kinsman. Some translations call it a redeemer. And some translations call it a close relative. By the way, you might notice that my whiteboard is a little wobbly. I don't know if that comes through or not. It's a little bit wobbly. Hopefully that'll be gone in the next day or two when I put up my big 4 by 8 I'm really excited. I'm really excited that I can move back and forth with that. I hope you're excited too. Probably not as much as me until you get to come in the studio and see it. I've been really crammed for the past few weeks and I'm excited to get to move a little bit. Now, let's talk about kinsman, redeemer, close relative. And it comes from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23 through 55. There are four qualities of the kinsman, redeemer, and Naomi knew what all of them meant, and Ruth maybe didn't know what any of them meant. So he's a kinsman redeemer. He's the close relative. Yay, we get to go to his house for get-togethers. We get to have family reunions there. Perhaps it was like that. Perhaps she did know. I mean, she was in the family for 10 years, and she could have been taught the law of Moses. Um, but here's it's going to go back all the way to the beginning. Remember, she had a law problem. Well, the kinsman redeemer is the law solution. In fact, you could go ahead and write that down. Leviticus chapter 25 offers the law solution for the widow and the land and the protection that these people seek. Now, uh, in order for there to be a kinsman redeemer, and I'm not going to uh, express exactly what he's going to do yet. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin the story for those who might not know it. But I just want to mention these four facts, and we're going to bring them up tomorrow, and we're going to bring them up Thursday and Friday as well, Lord willing. And as you see them day by day, I think you're really going to appreciate and uh, come to love the concept of the kinsman redeemer the way that I do and the way that the Bible lays it out. So here's some things I want you to think about. Uh, they must be related. So... If somebody was to be a kinsman redeemer, the close relative, the person who is able to overcome the law problem, they had to be related to you. They couldn't just be a stranger. They had to be related. But not only did they have to be related, they had to be willing, right? So the kinsman redeemer had to agree to the terms. That means they had to follow the law. They had to be a godly person. Eh? 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 Who's godly? Right? Who's related? Boaz. Okay. They must be related. They must be willing. Here's another one. They must be free. All right? If you are temporarily indentured in, in servitude as an Israelite, and you're not technically free, or if in other Old Testament laws there were cases whenever these people would, in fact, give themselves over in, in bondage to another Israelite, uh, then they couldn't redeem someone because they weren't free themselves. So you had to be free, you had to be willing, you had to be related, and finally, you must be able. 
Another way might be capable. You have to be able or capable. That means you had to be able to pay the price. It wasn't for free that they would get this land back, right? There would have to be a cost associated with it. And just think about Boaz. He's related, he's godly, and he's wealthy. That means he's able to pay the price. Now, we'll talk a lot more about the kinsman, redeemer, and close relative tomorrow. But I just want to end this Bible study with a couple of thoughts. Oh, there's my timer. There's my timer. So that means I need to wrap it up, which I feel like I'm doing pretty good. A um, couple of thoughts. First, let's talk about Naomi. And then finally, I want to ask the question, how can I be like Ruth? How can I be a woman of integrity or a man of integrity since I'm the one speaking? Um, but notice that when Naomi hears that she's gone to Boaz's field, she's like, woo, yes, he's related to us. Hooray, hooray. You see, Naomi recognizes all of the law problems are about to be resolved. And I just want to go back to her character real quick because it calls her Naomi in chapter 2. She's pleasant. This bitterness that she had in the end of chapter 1 is replaced at the end of chapter 2 with rejoicing. She is happy because she sees that there is possibly a way for them to be redeemed and for them to be protected again. It just so happens that all of these things fell into place. Here's the final question that I have for today. How can I be like Ruth? What I want you to do is I want you to write down Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And that verse says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Write that down. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as to the Lord. You want to be like Ruth? Sister, do you want to be like Ruth? Do you want to be a godly woman? Do you want to be a woman of faith? A woman of integrity? Brother, do you want to be a man who has characteristics of faith and integrity? Surely you do. All of us want to be considered faithful, and all of us want to have integrity. We want to be people who, have, who are known as loyal, known as having a, a good moral standard. We want these things. How do you do it? You go to work. And when you go to work, you work heartily for the Lord. So let me motivate you real quick. All of our work is different. Those of you who are younger, your work is school. You need to go to school and work heartily for the Lord. That means you're going to try hard on your tests. You're going to study hard. When teacher's talking, you're going to be listening. You're going to be respectful. Uh, especially if you're in public school uh, and in your large classrooms, it can be kind of challenging sometimes whenever people are disrespectful. But you're going to be a model of integrity. You're going to work hard at school. You're going to work hard in your part-time jobs. When you go work at McDonald's or Waffle House or Walmart or Target or wherever you go, again, we live in a culture where it's glorified to slack off. But you're not going to be that. Whatever you do, you're going to work heartily to the Lord. And when you're working for minimum wage, you're working for the Lord. Sister, if you're at home and maybe you don't have a job outside of the house, you know you have a job inside the house. You know it better than I do. You know that you're not off, that you're really on 24 hours a day, that when somebody wakes up in the middle of the night pukey, you're typically the one who has to go and take care of that. You're the one who has to change the diaper. You're the one who's nursing a young baby. You're the one who's fretting over the teenager who is out working their part-time job. Your job seems to never end whenever you're at home, but you're working for the Lord. And when you're cooking dinner or you're emptying the dishwasher, you're vacuuming the floor, when you're helping someone with homework, whenever you are encouraging your husband who's maybe going through a job switch, a, a transition, maybe he's lost his job, you are working heartily for the Lord. You're going to work. Brother, you're going to do whatever it takes to provide for your family. And sometimes that means it's not about money. But sometimes it's about the spiritual direction and the spiritual health of your home. And sometimes your job can get in the way. And so whatever you do, you're going to go to work and you're going to do it heartily to the Lord so that your family can be right with God. And if that means you need to change jobs so that you can be less career focused and more family focused, then you need to do it. Because you need to work heartily as to the Lord. For all of us, whether you're a retiree and maybe you're not in the workforce anymore, whether you're working two or three jobs to get through the day, maybe whatever it is, go to work. Be like Ruth. She was focused on the day, getting the day's needs met. And it just so happens 
that when she got the day's needs met, big things happened in her life. And I'm not here to promise you that big things are going to happen where, uh, you know, if you just go to work, then you're suddenly going to find a lottery ticket on the ground and become a billionaire. I'm not promising that at all. But Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself, sufficient for the day is its own troubles. So, whatever you do, do your work heartily as to the Lord. That's the Bible study for today. I'm very thankful for your presence, thankful for this whiteboard uh, setup that I have now that I'm able to kind of spread out a little bit. Oh, thank you, God. And uh, I'm looking forward to our Bible study tomorrow on Ruth chapter 3. And so I invite you to read ahead and uh, get yourself familiar with that selection. And I'll have uh, maybe a new whiteboard. Maybe I'll have this. I'm not quite sure yet. But by the end of the week, we should have our 4 by 8 up here. And I'm looking forward to that. Now, I like to end my Bible studies with prayer. And I'd like to encourage you, if anybody has a prayer request, please reach out to me in a private message, and I can uh, pray with you in this virtual way um, where we're praying together. And, and I just ask that if you want your prayers to be mentioned, that I'd love to help out in that way. Uh, let's see. Let's have prayer, and then I'll make a couple of closing thoughts to be done. Holy Father in heaven, how wonderful is your name. Thank you for your great plan of redemption, and thank you that we can study the book of Ruth and see redemption at work. Father, we're so thankful for Ruth, our dear sister who uh, has modeled faith. She's modeling integrity for us, and uh, we pray that you would bless us to continue to see her as the woman of virtue that she is, the woman of grace that she is, and we're excited to study her for the rest of the week if it is your will. We pray that you would bless those who are listening to this, that they would be active in the study, active in that they would take this information and synthesize it. They would reuse it. They would use it for uh, their own life. They would use it to help others and that your will would be accomplished through their life. We pray, Father, that you would help us to observe your providence. And whenever it seems like it just happened, you know, and things just kind of fall into place, we don't know your will, Father, ultimately. Um, on, on every detail that you have planned out for us, but we pray that we would give you glory and that we would be willing to say, perhaps, and that we would give you the credit instead of trying to keep it for ourselves. Father, we pray for our government leaders. We pray for our doctors, our nurses, and others who are ministering to us, and we pray that we at home would do our part and be helpful in our local community. We pray as Christians that for those who are faithful, that you would help us to be salt and light to the world. We pray for those who are not Christians who are watching this, that you would give them opportunity to repent, to be saved. And Father, we ask your blessings on us now as we depart. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are not a Christian, like I just mentioned in that prayer, uh, or if you have been part of the Lord's Church and perhaps you've left for uh, different fields, so to speak, then I just want to offer this uh, encouragement to you. It's not too late. Now, we don't know God's timeline, so it could be too late in a minute from now, or 10 minutes from now, or a day from now. We don't know. But the point is, is that the time is now, and I just want to encourage you to reach out in a private message, and um, I can do what I can on this side of it. I can help you plug in with people who are local to you, and we can help restore you to God in the way that you need to be. Uh, let's see, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, please come back for Ruth chapter 3 on Thursday at 11. And then Thursday on a different channel, I have um, Backyard Bees and Garden. I'll be doing a final virtual science lesson um, over there. And so go check that out on Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. That's all I have for today. May God bless you. And I hope that you are uh, blessed in this Bible study. Please let me know if they're helpful and what you might like to hear about next week. That would be good. We can start working on next week's stuff together. So I'm going to go ahead and end the streams first. Uh-oh. I may not be able to end the streams. Oh, there we go. The mouse is going. All right. Bye, YouTube. See you later. Bye, Facebook. See you later.